I'm Mary Sue Keppel, the editor of Calliope. Thank you for joining us with Writer to Writer. With me today is Elaine Conningsberg, E.L. Conningsberg, the author of 18 books and the winner of two Newbery medals, the latest one you've just received this year for The View from Saturday. Yes. I want to tell you, Elaine, that I thought this is a children's book and I will read it. And I must say that I closed it mm -hmm. at 1 o'clock in the morning saying to myself, how could I have been involved in a children's book? I stayed up until 1 o'clock in the morning and found myself turning the pages in absolute delight. So I want to say to the audience that um, no matter what your age, the middle-aged um, fifth or sixth or seventh grader, all the way through to 90, I'm sure that someone is going to enjoy this book, no matter the age. Is that the kind of reaction that you're getting? I don't think there's a greater compliment, and I, I thank you. Yes, and I, I thought at first when I was getting very positive remarks from South Florida, it was because they were my relatives, A, <laughs> and B, they lived in something very close to Century Village. Yeah. Century Village being one of the places that the right. story does take place, yeah. yeah. You have um, uh, characters that are set in Century Village, so part of the story takes place in Florida. Of course, you're very familiar with that. And part of it takes place in Upper New York, as I understand. Yes, in the Finger Lakes region of yeah. New York. Yeah. I have a daughter who lives there, ah, so I'm so familiar <laughs> with the geography of that area as well. As well. Um, your main characters are four children about the ages of sixth grade, and uh, a main character who is a paraplegic woman. I read one review that said your main character is probably the woman rather than the four children. I was wondering how you felt about that. Um, I think probably I would answer that by saying um, that she's fifth business. Uh, have you ever read Robertson Davies' book called Fifth Business? Mm -hmm. um, he was a music critic in addition to being a novelist mm -hmm. and a uh, Canadian, mm -hmm. Robertson Davies. And he wrote a book called Fifth Business in which he described that in an opera you have the uh, soprano, the tenor, the baritone, and the bass, but you have to have someone who makes everything happen, and that person is fifth business. The catalyst. The catalyst. Mm -hmm. And I think I would say Mrs. Olinsky, the paraplegic sixth grade teacher, is fifth business. I love the way how she, the way that she pulls the, the whole story together. And at the end, it's really become, in a sense, her story. Yes. Yes. You agree? Yes, I do. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when I say that this is a children's book then and the adult in the end becomes most important, how do you justify that to children? I don't. Uh, I, I think that uh, if you think that children would not be interested in adults, it's doing them a disservice. Right. Uh, I think that they are looking to understand adults uh, just as they, they, they look to, to find out who they are, they, they, they do so by brushing up against adults that they either admire or disadmire. And, and that's what I admired about this book. It was not a book just about little kids being little kids. No. It was about relationships on an adult level, on a child's level, on... Um, the whole gamut of ages. There was the very old, the mm -hmm. middle-aged, the young. Yeah. I don't remember any babies, though. Were there any babies in there? No, there's a dog. Just a, <laughs> the, the dog, the genius. <laughs> the, the one mm -hmm. that the girl thinks is, is the genius. When you sit down to write a book like this, um, it, some writers are setting out to, to work at, uh, with their children in terms of themes, and they know the themes that they want to, um, to, to write about and, and perhaps to make the children aware of or to, to make them um, accomplish in their own lives. Are you setting out to, to, um, to teach? Are the themes there before you write, or are you telling a story? I'm uh, telling a story. I think the themes have to write, ride in the back seat. I, I, I have 
I have mentioned how this book came about. Mm -hmm. uh, I, when I start writing, I start the movie in my head. Mm -hmm. I got to, I started a story about a young boy who was boarding a school bus the first day of sixth grade. Uh, a very strangely, for this area, yeah. strangely dressed young man boards the bus. And I went to take a walk on the beach. The little boy who, the strangely dressed young man, says that his father has taken over Sillington House, a long, un, long, for a long period, Sillington House had been unoccupied. He said his father has bought it and is going to turn it into a bread and breakfast inn, B and B inn. So I took a walk along the beach and I remembered that I had in my files a short story called the B and B letter, the bread and butter letter that a young man was forced to write by his mother after having had a visit in Century mm -hmm. Village. Mm -hmm. I walked along further and I remembered two other short stories I had and I realized that they were all united by a theme. Mm. So the theme was there, but it has to underlie, I think it has to underlie, I think you owe kids a good story. When you write for children, you particularly owe them a good story. And when you write for children, you have to realize that there are going to be an awful lot of kids who are going to get nothing but the story if they get the theme or what you're trying to say underneath the underlying message, quote, unquote message, um, that they're going to get it subliminally. Mm -hmm. um, something very similar happened when I wrote um, a collection of short stories called Throwing Shadows. Mm -hmm. In each of them, there was a young protagonist. Each of these, uh, telling a first person account again, and in each of these, the, the kid was rubbing up against someone either one generation or two generations removed from him. And I had written those stories over a period probably of seven years, mm -hmm. and they were all united. Uh, so uh, E.L. Doctorow, I think it was E.L. Doctorow who said that all really good writers have only one theme. <laughs> and yours is. <laughs> I have played variations on that theme. Uh, my theme, I, I found out, not because of research I did, but yeah. because an Englishman who was an outsider, <laughs> an outsider to our American children's literature scene, said, first of all, that my voice was very American, uh -huh. and he said that I dealt with the theme of identity. Mm -hmm. And that, that article happened at the same time that I was writing finishing this collection of short stories called Throwing Shadows. And after I had put the stories together, I realized, yes, each of them deals with a sense of identity, a child finding his identity. Which to me, though, seems very typical of, of what must be happening when you are around sixth grade, seventh grade. Uh, the big search is to find perhaps who you are and what your place is going to be in society and how you will fit in. There's a there's a level of awareness that that child is coming to that yeah. perhaps is not. Um, I like your term before. level of awareness. I think you're right. I think that, I think that sixth grade is critical. I yeah. think that it is the age at which children are in conflict because they want two things at the same time. They want acceptance mm -hmm. for being like everyone else, but they want acceptance for being different, different. from everyone else. Yeah. And until they can find that balance, they are really kind of hard to live with. <laughs> <laughs> and so your books are, are about that process, it seems yeah. to me, of, of the choices they but have to what, make. What you said is, is, so, uh, is so important. I hadn't thought of it before. Uh, because you're right, uh, at the sixth grade, at grade 12, they have a level of awareness that they could not have had at fourth grade. Mm -hmm. They could not have had at third grade. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Well, that's great. I just wanted to quote this. Um, um, the Newberry Committee says they liked about your winning novel, The View from Saturday, um, these things. It was a unique, jubilant tour de force characterized by good humor, positive relationships, distinctive personalities, and brilliant storytelling. <laughs> storytelling, of course, um, with the most wonderful adjective here being brilliant. Um, one of the things that we haven't discussed is humor and the role of humor that you would see in children's books, particularly yours. I think it's, um, 
it's a way to pull them in. Uh, I, I didn't know I was a humorous writer. I just, <laughs> I just wrote it as I felt it or, or saw it in that movie. Uh, in your head. The movie in, in your head. head. Yeah, yeah, right, the movie in my head. Uh, I'm glad they come out funny. <laughs> I, I enjoyed that about them very much. Um, one of the themes also that I saw in, in, in that book was the, the theme of the smart kid. We find so many kids today being written about or told about um, who are going through the crisis of being nasty, being negative, making evil choices, perhaps is, is not a great word, um, uh, wrong choices. And these kids are making good choices and they're having a, a good experience with life, in fact a wonderful experience with life, and in some sense sharing it with this older adult who then perhaps gets a more positive view of her own life as yeah. well. Absolutely. I, th I think that um, I have a grandson who is in eighth grade and my daughter mm -hmm, told me that <clears throat> there again the conflict is uh, it's all right to be smart, mm -hmm. but it's not all right to be good at school, to be uh, to get good grades. That's not cool. I don't know if cool is the current term. <laughs> not neat, whatever the current term is. Well, for a while it was bad, I'm sure that's yeah. not true. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't risk saying that because I'm not sure that the connotation for bad is still Good. Good. I know. <laughs> I, know. I, I, I agree with you. <clears throat> I um, find it impossible to keep up with the slang. I mm. ask my students uh, often, and, and they can't agree among themselves sometimes. Is that right? Yes. I, I find that fascinating. I do I ask too. my creative writing classes sometimes if they would give me three slang words, and they'll sit there and disagree about meanings, and I think, well, how do I expect myself to keep up? Yeah. It's fascinating. Mm. I, I would be very leery of putting those kinds of things into a, a teenage book or um, writing for teenagers. I admire your, your skill. And well, your, I don't know. I, I guess suppose. you would have to have footnotes within five years. <laughs> you would need the Monarch Study Guide, too. <laughs> <laughs> the cliff notes yeah, to the slang. Notes, yeah. um, I would just like to read one, one little thing that you said here on page 93, if I can find it real fast. You were talking about these, um, these children, um, young middle-aged adults, and um, Ethan is saying, something in Sillington House, this is the bed and breakfast place right. where they go to have tea, gave me permission to do things I had never done before, never even thought of doing. Something there triggered the unfolding of those parts that had been incubating, things that had lain inside me curled up like the turtle hatchlings newly emerged from their eggs, taking time in the dark of their nest to unfurl themselves. I never, I told jokes I had never told before. I asked questions I had never asked before. What can parents do to make that happen? I think everyone needs quiet time. I think that what they found in Sillington House was this idea of the third place. Um, mm -hmm. I, I talk about the third place mm -hmm. quite often now. Mm -hmm. um, the third place is where we go that is neither work nor home, or in the case of children, neither work nor school. Mm -hmm. And the third place is what we had at the Agora of Ancient Greece, the Forum of Rome, the Café de Dumeco in Paris. Um, when I was growing up, we had downtown. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, suburban America does not have a third place. And the third place is where you learn to um, conduct yourself as an adult. I think it is where you meet a longitudinal section as well as a horizontal section. When I see kids hanging out, is term hanging out still all right? When I, I use it. Okay. When I see them no hanging proof. out at the mall, they're not really mixing with adults in a way that is two ways mm -hmm. because the adults that they deal with at the mall are in some sort of servant capacity. They're either waiting on them at a restaurant or mm -hmm. they're serving them in a store. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what happened to Ethan at Sillington House and happened to the mall was that they learned to relate to, to themselves in terms of relating to others. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I think that Sillington House became their third place. Fascinating. So, so that was a little microcosm of, of what parents can do and what teachers can do in terms of, of creating those possibilities for children. Mm -hmm. Thanks for making me think about that. I would just like to change gears a little bit and talk about the fact that you have published a book called Talk Talk. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is a book for adults in which you have put together many of your major speeches. Mm -hmm. I understand that you go around the United States and um, often talk to huge groups of people right. and are um, a major speaker for wonderful kinds of events, not just literary events. What is the world view out of which you are speaking and writing? I'll throw you a question. Yeah. I, I think that most people, when they read your books, find a certain way of looking at life. I'm, I think that I'm, I'm a spokesperson for children's literature who came in through a back door. Uh, I once said to my editor, uh, do you think, Jean, since I came in through the back door, she looked at me and she said, everyone in children's literature came in through the back door. And I think that that was true years ago, not so true now. Mm -hmm. Maybe even 20 years ago it was true. Mm -hmm. My back door was through science. Mm -hmm. And I realized as an adult of my great interest in literature and art, but I've retained that interest in science. So my worldview, I think, is that I have this logical, rational mm -hmm. base with longings for feathery edges on everything. <laughs> uh, can you explain that a little bit more? I think that things happen that do not have a logical base uh -huh. that you can't explain. Uh -huh. uh, we, we can call those things of the spirit. We can call them aesthetic things. I mean, I don't know mm -hmm. how you explain good taste. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know that it's something you can train for. But I like having the background of science because it has helped me with organizing thoughts and I think with exposition mm -hmm. of those thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, it seems to me that there's a, a factual basis for most of what you write about. I hope but so. I love the way in which you talked about the feathery edges <laughs> because <laughs> there, is, there is certainly an appreciation mm -hmm. for much beyond the factual, mm -hmm. which is yeah. uh, so profound in your work. Mm -hmm. What would you, uh, you've been writing the first um, Newberry winner in 1968, and now it's obviously 30 years later almost. And you, you said you came into literature, uh, children's literature through the back door. What, what are some of those major changes that you have seen in, in children's lit? Um, with regard to literature itself, yeah. uh, I would say that it is a broadening of the base of allowable subject matter and uh -huh. allowable language. Uh -huh. um, it was very risque when I wrote from the mixed-up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler that um, Jamie uh, played cards mm -hmm. and cheated at playing cards. Mm -hmm. That was very risque. Well, now, of course, that is mild, safe. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the books themselves, mm -hmm. the, big, the biggest change has been the increased role of marketing in, in children's books. Mm -hmm. There are many, many, many more children's books being published than there were in 1967 when I first mm -hmm. published. And uh, there are some that are market created, I think. Um, mm -hmm. the, there is a huge market for board books. And, and uh, one woman told me that uh, she had always thought that, that writing children's books would be a very good way to make money because she had, uh, her grandson had a little book, only a few words on each page, and the thing cost $7.95. She says, of course, it was printed on rubber so he could take it into the bathtub. 
So, <laughs> so there are, are many more products. And that is one of the changes that has happened to the books is that some of them have become products yeah. as opposed to being literature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Newberry is obviously one of those awards that goes to literature rather yes. than just to yes. <laughs> the, yeah. the kind of book mm -hmm. that um, comes for a year or two or three. Well, there are, um, in, in addition, somewhere between um, book and product is, is the series book. Uh, we all grew up with Nancy Drew, and right. those books were written not by a single author, but they did have substance. Uh, mm -hmm. If you were to, to, to check on the making, suppose Nancy Drew is, ex is exploring pyramids. I don't know if she ever did. Secret of the Big Clock. My mother like never let us read oh, those. Oh, she never let well. No, Dostoevsky Well, you would find the information there, on pyramids probably to be probably accurate. So, probably so. But there is now series that are created by some editor or, or publisher saying, we need a series, and so let's write a series about uh, spooks, or let's yeah. write a series about this. So, so those were something between a book and a product. <laughs> what do you read? I read a lot of... Um, biography. I read current novels. Uh, I'm, I'm now, I think everyone is hot on memoirs, mm -hmm. right? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think Angela's Ashes probably started us all down that track. <laughs> Are you writing your memoirs? Uh, I, I haven't written my memoirs except I, well, I, I can't, that's not an, an entirely true story. Some years ago, I was asked to do an autobiography. And I thought about it very hard, and I said, okay, I, I think I can do it. I, I think I know how I can handle this. And I did, and I submitted it. And I, <laughs> I got it back, and the woman had crossed out the whole first three pages uh, above our readers' heads. And then I didn't really get furious until she got to the part where she crossed out I wrote that my father was from Hungary, and he spoke wonderful English with a rich Hungarian accent. And to this day, anyone speaking with a Hungarian accent can make a training, automobile training manual sound like Shakespeare to me. I wrote that. She crossed that out. And I thought, you can cross out a lot, but you can't take away my father's wonderful Hungarian <laughs> accent. And so we returned the advance. But I just last summer, I think it was last summer, I got an invitation to do a short memoir uh, for a collection called When I Was Your Age. And many children's book writers, I think in the first volume there were 10, and there'll be 10 in the second. Mm -hmm. I'll be in the second volume. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. When I was your age, of course, the age of my readers. So uh -huh. I, I wrote a, um, a short piece. I just have it home this morning. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm copy editing it. Um, and I call it How I Lost My Station in Life. Because when I was 11 and a half years old, my mother had a baby. I had been the baby of the family all those years, and my mother had this baby. <laughs> At 11. How dare she, right? Yes. This old woman. She was 34. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I wrote that, that short memoir. I'm very pleased with we it. We have very little time left, oh. but I know that you are also an artist, right? And yes. sometimes you illustrate your own yes. books. or. Um, do you do that? Um, how did you become an artist, I guess, is, is of interest to me. First the writer, then the artist, both at the same time, all your life? No, I, I, I always had an interest in art, but all those years I was in college taking long labs, I couldn't. Yeah. When my, uh, my first two children are 17 months apart, and when my daughter was born and was about six months old, I needed to do something. And... Um, they used to have what we called adult education, which is now Florida Community College. But mm -hmm. adult education had a, had a class in painting down in the old Jacksonville Art Museum in yeah. Riverside, that old house in mm -hmm. Riverside that's now mm -hmm. the location of some doctor's offices. Yes. So 
So I went there every Thursday night. And that's how you got started. That's how I got started. I wish we had more time to talk about this and more time to talk about how art has influenced on some of these the stories oh, that you yes. tell because there certainly is an amalgamation of the two, very, very thank definitely. You. Thank you. But I want to thank you for joining us today, for, for sharing some of your insights into being a children's writer, for um, sharing with us your point of view, not only in, in today's interview, but through your children's books and through Talk Talk. Thank you for joining us. I am Mary Sue Keffel, the editor of Calliope, and this has been Writer to Writer. Thank you. <laughs>